welcome to another broadcast of Comics Let's Talk. I'm Kevin Given. I review comic books for two sites, Comic Crusaders and Comics for Sinners. On the Comics for Sinners site, I also have a column called Given to Me. Generally, we talk about my comic book franchise, which I'm kind of on uh, Indie Planet right now, but hope to launch nationally pretty soon. It's Carl Vincent, Vampire Hunter. There is a movie in production right now, and I'm showing you a few stills from that movie. There is also an animated trailer I've made. Here's a bit of the animated trailer, which I'm trying to use to sell the concept to, uh, I don't know, Adult Swim, Cartoon Network, somewhere like that. Also, there's a comic book series. You can find free comic books of Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter digitally on Indie Planet and Drive Through Comics. Here are some panels from the latest comic book we're working on, Dracula Rising. The first issue was by Dennis Magnant. He has since moved on to another project that he's passionate about. You can find a free issue of the black and white version of Dracula Rising number one on Indie Planet and Drive Through Comics. Now here are some pages from uh, Dracula Rising number two. We're about four pages away from finishing that comic book. It will be out very soon by Rodolfo Ezequiel. If you like what you heard, if you love comic books, you're going to subscribe to my channel. Just hit that little red subscribe button. We'll get different shows for you every week or sometimes bi-weekly depending on my schedule we'll have at least two or three shows a month for you and we'll be talking about comic books and all things comic book related this week on comics let's talk in lieu of the new amazon prime tv series we're going to look at the history of conan the barbarian in the world of comic books plus we'll briefly touch on the character's history and other media appearances and my co-host april childers could not be with us today she's well she's real busy today has a lot to do but we won't go into that. She's doing her thing and can't be here. That's all we need to know. I want to remind you that I'm going to be starting my own Patreon site soon. If you're interested in Carl Vincent the Vampire Hunter at all, go to the Facebook page and like it. Plus, message me an email address that you won't mind me having so I can send you updates on Carl Vincent the Vampire Hunter and everything that's going to be happening. Right now you can get issues one through three on Indie Planet as well as Comics Central, and it should be on Comixology very soon. We're going to be launching nationally. I had announced that it would be through Evil Cat, but it's not going to be through Evil Cat now because they had a little change up of personnel, and due to technical reasons, they won't be picking up Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter. You can also find my other title, Comixology, Comics Central, Comixology, Kablam. It carries Adolescent Radioactive Samurai Platypi and Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter. Dracula Rising is the latest series. We're going to talk about that at the end of this broadcast. But first, let's talk about the creator of Conan. Robert Irvin Howard was an American author who wrote pulp fiction in a diverse range of genres. He is regarded as the father of the sword and sorcery subgenre. Howard was born and raised in Texas. He spent most of his life in the town of Cross Plains, with some time spent in nearby Brownwood. A bookish and intellectual child, he was also a fan of boxing and spent some time in his late teens bodybuilding, eventually taking up amateur boxing. From the age of nine, he dreamed of becoming a writer of adventure fiction, but did not have real success until he was 23. Thereafter, until his death by suicide at age 30, Howard's writings were published in a wide selection of magazines, journals, and newspapers, and he became proficient in several subgenres. His greatest success occurred after his death. Although a Conan novel was nearly published in 1934, Howard's stories were never collected during his lifetime. The main outlet for his stories was Weird Tales, where Howard created Conan the Barbarian. With Conan and other heroes, Howard helped fashion the genre now known of as sword and sorcery, spawning many imitators and giving him a large influence in the fantasy field. Howard remains a highly read author with his best works still reprinted. Howard's suicide and the circumstances surrounding it have led to speculation about his mental health. His mother had been ill with tuberculosis his entire life, and upon learning she had entered a coma from which she was not expected to wake, he walked out to his car and took his own life with a 380 Colt automatic. From the age of nine, he began writing stories, mostly tales of historical fiction centering on Vikings, Arabs, battles, and bloodshed. One by one, he discovered the authors who would influence his later work, Jack London, and his stories of reincarnation and past lives, most notably The Star Rover from 1915. Rudyard Kipling's tales of subcontinent adventure and his chanting shamanic verse, the classic mythology tales collected by Thomas Bullfinch, 
Howard was considered by friends to be an edetic and astounded them with his ability to memorize lengthy reams of poems with ease after one or two readings. After years of rejection slips and near acceptances, he finally sold a short caveman tale titled Spear and Fang, which netted him the sum of $16 and introduced him to the readers of a struggling pulp called Weird Tales. In May 1927, he returned to writing, including a rewrite of The Shadow Kingdom. He rewrote it again in August and submitted it to Weird Tales in September. The story was an experiment with the entire concept of the weird tale horror fiction as defined by practitioners like Edgar Allan Poe, A. Merritt, and H.P. Lovecraft. Mixing elements of fantasy, horror, and mythology with historical romance, action, and swordplay into thematic vehicles never before seen. A new style of tale which ultimately became known as Sword and Sorcery, featuring Cull, a barbarian precursor to Howard's later heroes such as Conan. The tale hit Weird Tales in August 1929 and received fanfare from readers. Weird Tales editor Farnsworth Wright brought the story for $100, the most Howard had earned for a story at this time. And several Several more cull stories followed. However, all but two were rejected, convincing Howard not to continue the series. In March 1928, Howard salvaged and resubmitted to Weird Tales a story rejected by the more popular pulp Argosy, and the result was Red Shadows, the first of many stories featuring the vengeful Puritan swashbuckler Solomon Kane. Appearing in the August 1928 issue of Weird Tales, the character was a big hit with readers, and this was the first of Howard's characters to sustain a series in print beyond just two stories. Seven Kane stories were printed in the 1928 to 1932 period. As the magazine published the Solomon Kane tale before Call, this could be considered the first published example of sword and sorcery. Early 1932 saw Howard taking one of his frequent trips around Texas. He traveled through the southern part of the state with his main occupation being, in his own words, the wholesale consumption of tortillas, enchiladas, and cheap Spanish wine. In Fredericksburg, while overlooking sullen hills through a misty grain, he conceived of the fantasy land of Samaria, a bitter, hard northern region, home to fearsome barbarians. In February, while in mission, he wrote the poem Samaria. It was also during this trip that Howard first conceived of the character of Conan. Later in 1935, Howard claimed in a letter to Clark Ashton Smith that Conan simply grew up in my mind a few years ago when I was stopping in a little border town on the lower Rio Grande. However, the character actually took nine months to develop. Conan the Barbarian is a fictional hero who originated in pulp fiction magazines and has since been adapted to books, comics, several films, including Conan the Barbarian and Conan the Destroyer television programs, both cartoon and live action. Also video games, role-playing games, and other media. The first comic book adaptation of a Howard Conan story was the feature Lorena de la Costa Negra, taken from the original Conan story, Queen of the Black Coast, in the miniature-sized Mexican anthology titled Suentes de Abuelito, Abuelito No. 8, 1952, published by Corporation Editorial Mexicana, although Conan, for some reason, was blonde in this comic book. Almost 20 years later, he was introduced to the Marvel Universe in 1970 with Conan the Barbarian, written by Roy Thomas, illustrated by Barry Smith, and published by Marvel Comics. Marvel's associate editor at this time, Thomas, had obtained the licensed property from the estate of creator Robert E. Howard after finding Conan chief among readers' requests for literary properties to be adapted to comics which also included the pulp magazine character Doc Savage, the Lord of the Rings over of writer J.R.R. Tolkien and Edgar Rice Burroughs characters Tarzan and jo John Carter of Mars. I put together a memo for publisher Martin Goodman saying why we should license the character. In the late 60s, there were a lot of things that were happening that uh, made Stanley and myself as his more as assistant editor, associate editor, whatever title, I had that week, um, decide we should branch out a little bit, uh, more than just superheroes. You know, we were losing some things, the Westerns and the models and so forth, that was okay, but we wanted to branch out to some other fields. This was a, probably an interest of mine even more than Stan's. I love the superheroes, but I wanted to see other things done. But I wasn't really familiar with Conan too much. I had bought the first copy off the newsstand uh, because of the Frank Rosetta cover, just as I bought that The Cull book, also by Robert E. Howard, because of Roy Crankle. Uh, because these were two artists I, that I knew and respected. But I started reading 
the Conan book, and I thought it was going to be something like John Carter of Mars, which I was familiar with, because it talked about Atlantis and all that, you know, so I thought it was going to be, you know, ray guns and stuff like that. I didn't really get into Conan. I read the first few pages, and he just comes in, and he drags, it was the people of the Black Circle stories in that very first Conan of the Adventure paperback with the archetypical Frank Frazetta cover of, of Conan with the girl wrapped around his leg, on, and he's on top of the hill of bodies and skeletons and so forth. And uh, so I put it aside after reading it because it just, he just comes in and he um, throws this girl over his shoulder and takes off with her. It didn't seem to have the elements of fantasy I was looking for, at least in the first five pages. I didn't give it much <laughs> chance. And uh, so I put it aside and didn't pay attention to it for a year or two. But in the meantime, Stan and I were getting a lot of letters. Uh, well, Stan was getting the letters. I was getting to read them. And uh, saying, why don't you guys uh, do things like uh, Tolkien? which we looked into, and they said it wasn't available at the time. Uh, Doc Savage, which we eventually did, and, and we're looking at at the time. Uh, Burroughs, which we looked into, and uh, eventually, several years later, they did do, for, uh, for a couple of years. Although, uh, some of the stuff was done, of course, by uh, DC earlier. And also, Conan, you know, and at least I knew what that was, Conan and Colin, in a very vague sense. But we didn't figure we could afford, we could afford Conan, so we were going to get uh, something else. We were going to get Thongar by Lynn Carter, which was sort of half John Carter, half Conan Invitation that I saw, and I liked this the cover to one of the books that Frazetta also did. Uh, in fact, one of them of Thongar riding a pterodactyl. I, I bought the original oil of it, owned for several years after that, and uh, then somehow things got stalled in getting the rights to Thongar. Stan thought that was a better name than Conan anyway, you know. Uh, so. One day I, I saw, I just read for the, maybe the first time the introductions that were printed by L. Sprague de Camp in, all, in the opening, in the first few pages of all the Conan books. It would talk about who Conan was and who Robert e. Howard was. At the end it would mention this Howard Collector fan magazine that was put out by Glenn Lord, the literary agent for the Robert E. Howard estate. Now other people might look at something else. The first thing I saw was literary agent. Now that meant he must have some rights there that, uh, that maybe, maybe we Maybe he was someone we could approach. We knew that uh, we weren't going to be able to approach DeCamp because he was a book author and he was going to want royalties and all this stuff in a certain sense that we were just never going to, that the publisher uh, was just not going to pay. It had to be something where the people just wanted it done and thought it might be good without having to get a lot of money for it right away. So I just uh, dropped Glenn a line, it was his address, in Pasadena, to Texas, same as then uh, in 1969 as it is now. And uh, Glenn uh, was interested. He had the rights to sell the rights to Conan and to the Robert E. Howard stories, if not the ones that DeCamp and Carter and others had uh, been associated with. So we, we struck a deal. I, uh, I was authorized to give a very small amount of money, which you know I just you know, shouldn't reveal. It would be embarrassing anyway, per issue and, uh, and so forth. And uh, I actually offered $50 a page or $50 a book or something, a little small sum more than I was authorized to. So that's how I ended up writing Conan. Because I wasn't planning on doing it, but if if I gave it to someone else and the publisher remembered how much he authorized me to offer per issue, and I and remembered that I had offered fifty dollars that this was fifty bucks more, uh, he was liable to be upset. He you know, was not known to be a generous man in certain ways, like many publishers who had come out of the pulp magazines and comics for that matter. So um, I decided I'd write the first couple of issues and try to sneak it in there because then, if, if, he, if there was any problem, at least I could take it off my own rate and write a couple of free pages or something. I don't know what rate I was getting, but it was enough that that would have added up to a couple of pages probably. And uh, so that was it basically. And the next thing you know, I found myself writing 115 issues in a row of Coleman and only left because I left Marvel entirely. Uh, the couple of years of the newspaper strip, almost all of the last two weeks. Uh, I would have continued that, but uh, even after I left Marvel, but uh, uh, the, pub, the editor chief wouldn't let me continue that if I it was leaving the company of the comics. Um, the first 60 issues of Savage Sword, the first eight of King Conan, which later became Conan the King, and uh, and a bunch of assorted specials, some five or six thousand pages, plus starting Cull and uh, the Red Zone. The extra cost meant, however, that Marvel could not budget for John Racima, Thomas's first choice. Serendipitously, this opened the door to Barry Windsor Smith. Racima said in a 1994 interview, I was approached by Roy Thomas with a project to do Conan. He mailed a couple of the paperbacks to me and I read them. 
and I loved them. I told Roy, this is what I want. Something that I can really sink my teeth into. At the time, my Marvel was owned by Martin Goodman, and he felt my rate was too high to take the gamble with on some kind of a new project. It wasn't a superhero or anything that had been done before. The closest thing to that would have been Tarzan. Anyway, he had no confidence in spending too much time on the book. And that's where Barry Smith came in. He was very cheap. I know what he got paid, and I'd be embarrassed to tell you how much it was because I'd be embarrassed for Marvel. Comics historian Les Daniels noted that Conan the Barbarian was something of a gamble for Marvel. The series contained the usual elements of action and fantasy, to be sure, but it was set in a past that had no relation to the Marvel Universe, and it featured a hero who possessed no magical powers, little humor, and comparatively few moral principles. Marvel initially published Conan every two months. After sales of number one were strong, Marvel quickly made the title monthly, but sales dropped with each additional issue. Stan Lee decided to cancel the comic with number seven, not only because of the weak sales, but to use Smith on more popular comics. Thomas argued against this decision, and Lee relented, although the book became bi-monthly again with number 14. But by number 20, Conan became monthly because of rising sales, and the comic became one of Marvel's most popular in the 1970s. Elric of Melibone first appeared in comics in Coney and the Barbarian issues number 14 through 15, 1972. The comics were written by Thomas and illustrated by Windsor Smith, based on a story plotted by Michael Moorcock and James Cawthorn. Red Sonja was introduced in issue number 23. That was in 1973. The highly successful Conan the Barbarian series spawned the more adult black and white Savage Sword of Conan in 1974. Published as part of Marvel's line of black and white magazines, written by Thomas with most art by John Buscema or Alfredo Alcala, Savage Sword of Conan soon became one of the most popular comic series of the 1970s and is now considered a cult classic. The Marvel Conan stories were also adapted as a newspaper comic strip, which appeared daily and Sunday from September 4, 1978 to April 12, 1981. Originally written by Thomas and illustrated by John Buscema, the strip was continued by several different Marvel artists and writers. Marvel ceased publishing all Conan titles in 2000. In 2003, Dark Horse Comics acquired the license to publish the character. From 1970 to 1993, Marvel published 275 issues of Conan the Barbarian. The Sumerian also appeared in the first five issues of Savage Tales, 12 annuals, five giant size issues, 235 black and white Savage Sword of Conan magazines, 55 issues of King Conan, 14 reboot issues called Conan the Adventurer, 10 issues of Conan the Savage, and 11 issues of Conan. Roy Thomas had Barry Windsor Smith provide art for a sword and sorcery story, Star of the Slayer in Chamber of Darkness, number 4, April of 1970. This is how he got started on the issue. Soon afterwards, Thomas offered Windsor Smith the job as a penciler for Marvel's adaptation of Conan, starting with Conan the Barbarian, number 1, in October of 1970. Comics historian Les Daniels notes that Windsor Smith's initial efforts were slightly sketchy, but his technique progressed by leaps and bounds within a few months. He had achieved a style never seen in comics before. During his run on Conan the Barbarian, Windsor Smith was involved in the writings as well. He and writer Roy Thomas adapted a number of Howard short stories, the aforementioned Frost Giant's Daughter, Tower of the Elephant, Rogues in the House, and Red Nails, as well as the art and story contributions. Windsor Smith provided the covers for most issues. They worked on original adventures and characters based on R.E. Howard's characters, most notably the flame-haired warrior woman, Red Sonja. Loosely based on a character from one of Howard's non-Conan stories, who has now become a major comics character in her own right. In the Song of Red Sonja in Conan the Barbarian number 24 of, from 1973, Windsor Smith's last issue of the title. By then, he had worked on 21 of the first 24 issues of the series, missing only issues number 17 and number 18 and number 22, which was a reprint of issue number one. Windsor Smith would later say that the reason he missed those issues was because he had quit the series a number of times as he was dissatisfied with the work and how comics business worked, rather than the deadline problems Marvel quoted. In 2010, Comics Bulletin ranked Thomas and Windsor Smith's work on Tony and the Barbarian seventh on its list of top 10 1970s Marvels. Then came Big John Buscema. He took over the title with the next issue and drew, this is from Salute Mag, even when drawing the powerful Conan, whose look had already been defined for many fans by the renowned painter and fantasy artist Frank Frazetta, Busima gave the character an aesthetic and lithe grace, despite his bulk. This resonated with readers. Busima's celebrated work on the character was so popular it had a role in convincing producers to greenlight the first Conan film 
which debuted in 1982. Naturally, Gosima penciled and inked the beautiful comic adaptation of this movie. Gosima began penciling Conan and the Barbarian with number 25 in April of 1973, following Barry Smith's celebrated run and debuted as the Conan artist of the black and white comics magazine Omnibus Savage Sword of Conan with issue number one. That was August of 1974. He would eventually contribute to more than 100 issues of each title, giving him one of the most prolific runs for an artist on a single character. He additionally drew the Conan Sunday and daily syndicated newspaper comic strips upon its premiere in 1978. Then we come to Dark Horse's run on the character. Seven major comic series published by Dark Horse Comics. The first series, titled simply Conan, ran for 50 issues from 2004 to 2008. The second, titled Conan the Sumerian, began publication in 2008 and lasted 25 issues until 2010. The third series, titled Conan, Road of Kings, started publishing in December 2010 and ended in January 2012 after 12 issues. A fourth series, titled Conan the Barbarian, continuing from Road of Kings, lasted 25 issues from February 2012 to March of 2014. A fifth series, titled Conan the Avenger, started publishing in April 2014 and ended in April 2016 after 25 issues. A sixth and final series titled Conan the Slayer lasted 12 issues from July 2016 to August of 2017. Another series titled King Conan, which takes place during Conan's time as king, ran in parallel and launched in February 2011. That series concluded in 2016 with 24 issues. Dark Horse has also published half a dozen one-shots and almost a dozen miniseries. Dark Horse Comics began their take on Conan in 2003 the one-shot prologue, Conan number zero, Conan the Legend. Conan the Sumerian, Conan Road of Kings, and Conan the Barbarian series presents a fresh interpretation, incorporating both new material and adaptations of stories by Robert E. Howard. With no other connection to many Marvel comic series or other post-Howard material, an ongoing dialogue between two characters, the Prince and the Wazir, Living in the age century and Conan's future is often used as a framing device for the stories. Each issue also contains the adventures of Two Gun Bob, two stories from the life of Robert E. Howard by Jim and Ruth Keegan. Writers for Dark Horse's Conan included Kurt Busiek, Timothy Truman, and Paul Lee. Artists included Harry Nord, Thomas Yates, Eric Powell, Thomas Girelli, and Tom Mandrake. The series won many awards, including four Will Eisner Comic Industry Awards, which also included Best Single Issue or One Shot Conan No. 0, The Legend, four Eagle Awards, including Favorite New Comic, Conan. The second run, Conan the Sumerian, included stories by Timothy Truman and art from Thomas Giarello, Richard Corbin, Joe Kubert, and Paul Lee. The third series included stories from Roy Thomas with art from Mike Hawthorne and Dan Panosian. The fourth series included stories by Brian Wood with art from Becky Clonan, James Harron, Vasilis Lolos, Declan Chalve, Mirko Klorak, Andrea Moody, David Gianfilius, Paul Azaceta, Ricardo Bercelli. Conan the Avenger was Dark Horse Comics' fifth series with Fred Van Lenthe as the writer, Daryl Mandrake, Brian Chung Gill, Villanova, Eric Powell, Brian Ching, Jason Felix, Paul Renaud, Jose Lewis, Andy Owens, and Simon Bisley. Conan the Slayer was Dark Horse Comics' sixth and final series about Conan with Cullen Bunn as the writer. There were also many one-shots and comic book crossovers with the likes of Wonder Woman and Red Sonja. From Sci-Fi Wire, Matthew Jackson. Earlier this year, we learned that Conan the Barbarian would be returning to Marvel Comics after years of stories published by Dark Horse. Now Marvel has revealed the creative team that will guide the Sumerian in its new adventures. The publisher announced Friday that Conan the Barbarian No. 1, a new ongoing series starring the legendary fantasy hero created by Robert E. Howard, will be brought to us in January by the team of writer Jason Aaron, artist Mohamed Asra, cover artist Asad Ribic, and colorist Matt Wilson. That's an all-star lineup for one of the most beloved genre characters of all time. Aaron and Asra in particular credit Conan as a figure responsible for jump-starting their perspective imaginations. Now let's look at the history of Conan on the silver screen, both in movies and TV, live action and animation. The very first Conan cinematic project was planned by Edward Summer. Summer envisioned a series of Conan films much like the James Bond franchise. He outlined six stories for this film series, but none were ever made. An original screenplay by Summer and Roy Thomas was written, but their lore-authentic screen story was never filmed. 
However, the resulting film, Conan the Barbarian, from 1982, was a combination of director John Milius, ideas and plots from Conan stories, also written by Howard's successors, notably Lynn Carter and L. Sprague de Camp. The addition of Nietzschean motto and Conan's life philosophy were crucial for bringing the spirit of Howard's literature to the screen. The film was followed by a less popular sequel, Conan the Destroyer, in 1984. This sequel was a more typical fantasy genre film and even less faithful to Howard's Conan stories, being just a picturesque story of an assorted bunch of adventurers. The third film in the Conan trilogy was planned for 1987 to be titled Conan the Conqueror. The director was to be either Guy Hamilton or John Gilderman. Since Arnold Schwarzenegger was committed to the film Predator and De Laurentiis' contract with the star had expired, after his obligation to Red Sonja and Raw Deal, he wasn't keen to negotiate a new one. Thus, the third Conan film sank into development hell. The script was eventually turned into Cull the Conqueror, starring the Hercules actor Kevin Sorbo. There were rumors in the late 1990s of another Conan sequel, a story about an older Conan titled Conan the King, Crown of Iron. But Schwarzenegger's election in 2003 as governor of California ended this project. Warner Brothers spent seven years trying to get the project off the ground. However, in June 2007, the rights reverted to Paradox Entertainment, though all drafts made under Warner remained with them. In August of 2007, it was announced that Millennium Films had acquired the rights to the project. Production was aimed for a spring 2006 start, with the intention of having stories more faithful to the Robert E. Howard creation. In June of 2009, Millennium hired Marcus and Spell to direct. In January of 2010, Jason Momoa was selected for the role of Conan. The film was released in August 2011 and met poor critical reviews and box office results. The Legend of Conan In 2012, producers Chris Morgan and Frederick Malmberg announced plans for a sequel to the 1982 Conan the Barbarian titled The Legend of Conan, with Arnold Schwarzenegger reprising his role as Conan. A year later, Dateline reported that Andrea Berloff would write the script. Years passed since the initial announcement as Schwarzenegger worked on other films. But as late as 2016, Schwarzenegger affirmed his enthusiasm for making the film and saying, interest is high, but we're not rushing. The script was finished and Schwarzenegger and Morgan were meeting with possible directors. In April of 2017, producer Chris Morgan stated that Universal had dropped the project, although there was a possibility of a TV show. The story of the film was supposed to be set 30 years after the first, with some inspiration from Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven. And now we come to television. There have been three television series related to Conan. Conan the Adventurer is an animated television series produced by Jetlag Productions and Sunbow Productions that debuted on October 1st of 1992. It ran for 64 episodes exactly two years later on October 1st, 1994. The series involved Conan chasing serpent men across the world in an attempt to release his parents from eternal imprisonment as living statues. Conan the Young Warriors is an animated television series that premiered in 1994 and ran for 13 episodes. DIC Entertainment produced the show and CBS aired the series as a spin-off to the previous animated series. This cartoon took place after the finale of Conan the Adventurer with Wrath Ammon and Vanquished and Conan's family returned to life from Living Stone. Conan soon finds that the family of one of his friends are being turned into wolves by an evil sorceress and he must train three warriors in order to aid him in rescuing them. Conan the Adventurer is a live-action television series that premiered on September 22, 1997 and ran for 22 episodes. It starred German bodybuilder Rolf Muller as Conan and Danny Woodburn as his sidekick Otley. The storyline was quite different from the Conan lore of Howard. In this adaptation, Conan is a pleasant and jovial person. Also in this version, Conan is not a loner, but one member of a merry band of adventurers. In February of 2018, Deadline reported that a new Conan TV series was in the works at Amazon Prime, with Ryan Condal, Miguel Sapochnik, Warren Littlefield, Pathfinder Media, and Endeavor Content working on the project. And that brings us to the end of another broadcast. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'm Kevin Given for Comics Let's Talk. If you like what you heard, if you love comic books, you're going to subscribe to my channel. Just hit that little red subscribe button, and we'll get different shows for you every week or sometimes bi-weekly depending on my schedule we'll have at least two or three shows a month for you and we'll be talking about comic books and all things comic book related and if you like the carl vincent vampire hunter and are more curious about that franchise go to facebook and like 
the Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter page. Until the next show, this is Kevin Given, comic book reviewer for Comics for Sinners and Comic Crusaders. I also have a column on the Comic for Sinners site, which usually discusses my Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter series. Please look it up. Let me know what you think. You can get free digital copies of Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter comics on Indie Planet and Drive Through Comics. Check it out. You might like it. If you didn't, it was free. Until next week, this is Kevin Gibbons saying, have a good day and keep reading those comics.